Okay, so this is another chart describing the basic homeostasis of blood pressure and isotonic fluid. And again, with any homeostatic diagram, we've got to talk about four major components. We've got to talk about the names of too low, too high, causes of too low, too high, the effects of too low and too high, and then how the body's going to correct this deviation from homeostasis. Our first question is usually, why is this important? Again, we're going to come back to this, but it provides the opportunity to talk about why I'm combining blood pressure with isotonic fluid. If there's an increase or decrease in isotonic fluid, this isn't really going to affect the concentrations of ions, and so the major effect is on blood pressure. An increase in fluid will increase blood pressure, a decrease in pressure will cause a loss of blood pressure. Because ions are not really affected, we don't really refer to this as dehydration or overhydration. We refer to it as hypovolemia, when blood pressure or isotonic fluid is too low, and hypervolemia, when blood pressure or isotonic fluid is too high. The causes of hypovolemia are fairly simple. It's going to be blood loss or fluid loss. This loss would generally be caused by hemorrhage, but it could be loss of fluid due to burns or large-scale inflammations. The causes of hypervolemia could be a high-salt diet, where the high-salt also increases water consumption to increase overall isotonic fluid. Could be IV overdosage. Could be drinking too much water. And it also could be estrogen. Estrogen causes the retention of fluid, and that can cause hypervolemia. The effects of hypovolemia are essentially those you'd expect for low blood pressure, and so that's why I have these pictures. So essentially low blood pressure. We'd also expect insufficient nutrient delivery and cell death. Anytime mean arterial pressure drops below 60 millimeters of mercury, we're not going to adequately deliver nutrients to our organ systems, and they could fail. could also cause fainting. In hypervolemia, we could expect damaged blood vessels because there's too much fluid filling those vessels. That could lead to aneurysms where there's ballooning of the blood vessels. They can eventually burst and lead to blood loss. Or if it's in the brain, neurons really don't like blood. And so they can be kind of stunned or even damaged and killed if they're exposed to blood. The last thing is you can have high afterload that stresses the heart. That can lead to hypertrophy and down the road can lead to congestive heart failure. While the consequences seem pretty simple in their brevity, they're quite important consequences, and that's fairly obvious by the number of mechanisms involved in regulating blood pressure. The first of many mechanisms is aldosterone. In hypovolemia, we'd expect the JG cells to see less stretch. They're going to detect less pressure. That's going to cause them to release renin, which is going to go through an entire cascade, resulting in aldosterone, which causes sodium reabsorption to increase fluid volume. There's baroreceptors in the carotid and also in the aortic arch. They're going to signal to the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system can increase vessel tone, systemic vessel tone. It can also constrict the afferent arterial, which means you're going to decrease glomerular filtration, not lose fluid, which is the same as increased fluid volume, and get blood pressure back up. The mouth can detect a lack of fluid, or more likely it's going to detect an increase in osmolarity or decrease in fluid volume and stimulate thirst. The thirst is quenched rapidly after the mouth has been moistened, or the mucosa of the mouth has been moistened, and the stomach stretches with the increased fluid. And this is important rather than waiting for a complete correction to occur and for the hypothalamus to sense that osmolarity has gone back down. Otherwise, we'd continue to be thirsty, continue to drink water, and we might overconsume and cause water intoxication. If there's a decreased fluid, this decreases the pressure of filtration in the kidneys. This also contributes to a decline in filtration with less filtrate formed, Less urine is formed and fluid is retained. The hypothalamus also stimulates the posterior pituitary, should have wrote posterior pituitary here. That stimulates the release of ADH. So I guess I got it confused because the hypothalamus stimulates the posterior pituitary. That stimulates the release of ADH. ADH is antidiuretic hormone, goes down to the collecting duct and increases the reabsorption of water. AMP, or atrionatriuretic protein, is released by the heart. It's generally released in response to high blood pressure. But if there's decreased pressure in the atria, it'll stop releasing as much AMP. That releases an inhibition on angiotensin II, which allows sodium to be reuptaken. Once you reuptake sodium, you're going to increase your fluid volume because you're going to take up water as well. And that's going to get your blood pressure and isotonic fluid back into homeostasis. The mechanisms to deal with hypervolemia are very similar, if in the opposite direction, to those that counter hypovolemia. So again, we have the JG cells. Now they're going to detect an increased stretch, and they're going to decrease renin aldosterone. So increased stretch means there's an increased blood pressure. We're going to decrease renin. When we inhibit renin, we inhibit this whole cascade, and so we inhibit aldosterone production. We don't absorb as much sodium, and that gets our fluid volume back down. Again, there's baroreceptors and sodium receptors that inform the sympathetic nervous system. That's going to dilate the afferent arterial. 
It can also decrease systemic vessel tone. When we dilate the afferent arterial, that's going to increase glomerular filtration rate. It's going to increase the amount of filtrate, and that's going to increase the amount of urine. We're going to get rid of this extra fluid and bring ourselves back down into homeostasis. Similarly, if there's increased fluid going through the kidney, that's going to increase the filtration pressure. More filtrate is going to be formed, and we're going to excrete more urine. The last one is blood pressure is sensed by the right atrium. And that's kind of a cool mechanism because it means the heart can weigh in on blood pressure. And if it's overstretched, it's going to release a peptide called atrial natriuretic protein. And that inhibits angiotensin II. Angiotensin II is in the renin cascade. So if you inhibit angiotensin II, you inhibit the ability of renin to increase sodium absorption and cause vasoconstriction. That's going to cause less sodium to be absorbed. Or we can say that the sodium is going to be excreted or secreted at the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. Get rid of that sodium, you're going to get rid of that water, and that's going to decrease blood pressure. So that's the basic homeostasis of blood pressure and isotonic fluid.